Welcome. I'm Michelle Kals, Director of Business Development with Rogers Behavioral Health, and I am your moderator for today. With me are two experts in the assessment and treatment of depression, Dr. Rachel Leonard, Clinical Director at Roger Behavioral Health St. Paul location. Dr. Leonard is the first author of Roger's Clinical Protocols for Depression Recovery. Joining Dr. Leonard is Dr. Christopher Loudon, the adult attending psychiatrist at Rogers Hinsdale Clinic, which is one of the two clinics Rogers operates in the Chicago area. Before we get started, I just wanna give a quick overview of the format. The webinar is scheduled for 90 minutes. In order to receive CE credits, you must be logged into the webinar for the entire program. We are recording the webinar and it will be published on our website along with the slides for you to rewatch at your convenience. However, please note that you must, in order to get your CE credits, you must be um, in attendance during the live webinar. Doctors Leonard and Loudon will give a 75 minute presentation. Following their presentation, I will facilitate the Q&A session. If you want to ask the presenters a question during the presentation, please use the Q&A button to send me a message. At the bottom of your screen, you simply quick click the Q&A button on that Zoom taskbar and I will review the questions submitted. Then presenters will um, address them during the Q&A portion of the webinar. Please note that we have nearly a thousand attendees today and all questions, we may not get to all questions, but I will be collecting them all to answer later if they don't get answered during the webinar. Um, now I'll turn it over to our presenters. Hi everyone, I'm Rachel Leonard. Um, so first of all, we do not have anything to disclose. Here are the learning objectives for today. Um, so you're welcome to review those. We'll talk um, through some of the rationale for treatment in behavioral activation, discuss modifications to pharmacotherapy related to the pandemic, and um, look to have you identify some adaptations to implementing behavioral activation um, in light of the pandemic and need for telehealth. What we'll cover today um, is listed here. This includes um, some overview of behavioral activation for the treatment of depression, pharmacotherapy for depression, uh, benefits to combining those two approaches, and then some considerations in light of the COVID-19 pandemic, including both telehealth recommendations as well as some modifications to psychiatry and to therapy. And again, um, please use that Q&A feature to send in questions as um, you have them throughout the talk. So starting with behavioral activation for the treatment of depression. First, I um, wanted to review a little bit of the research support for BA. It is a well-established empirically validated treatment. A number of studies have found that BA leads to equal or better outcomes um, compared to other established treatments or control treatments. There's growing evidence of BA um, for adolescents, including a manual published in 2016 for this purpose. And there's evidence that BA might be more cost effective and easier to train and disseminate than CBT for depression. So how does BA explain um, how people become depressed? Uh, one thing I really like about this model is that the idea presented to patients isn't that there's something wrong with you, that you're broken. It's that you are depressed because of the environment you're in, because of the events that have been happening to you. And so Typically, that might start with a stressful event. This could be um, a breakup, um, problems at work or school, um, different friendship, you know, relationship problems. It could be a positive thing like a promotion that leads to a move across the country and then loss of some social support. And it might be nothing really tangible, but some small changes that happen over time. When that happens, um, people can feel a variety of different painful emotions some of which are criteria for depression. And really the important part here is this link between those painful emotions and our behavior, um, which often is avoidance. And um, that avoidance can take different forms for different people. It might be really excessive uh, video game playing. It could be 
um, sleeping 12 hours a day. It might be calling in sick to school or work, avoiding spending time with um, romantic partners or friends, family. So um, whatever those avoidance behaviors are, the, that's a perfectly natural response to those painful emotions where we have this tendency to feel more vulnerable and to retreat. Um, so that's, that's kind of normal. Um, we want to give our patients that message that this makes sense. But the problem is that then we might experience more and more triggers over time. So maybe we lose our job because we call in sick so often or we um, get really poor grades at school. Um, we have relationship problems because of our avoidance. And that can make the cycle continue and get worse over time. And so the point um, to our patients here is that your depression makes sense and that there are things that we can do about it um, to help you feel better. And so the goal of BA um, is to help our patients gradually reduce those avoidance behaviors and start to replace them gradually with some active coping strategies. And the goal is for our patients to have a, um, different, diverse, stable sources of positive reinforcement, which simply means that we don't want them to put all of their eggs in one basket. If we have a, a teenage patient who is a star athlete, um, and that's really where he derives his meaning in life and doesn't have a lot of other areas um, where he gets that meaning and enjoyment, he might be more susceptible to depression than someone who perhaps is that um, same star athlete and um, doesn't you know, have academics um, as an interest, doesn't have other hobbies. And, and if that person um, gets an ACL injury or, or can't participate in that activity any longer, they might be um, more okay. They might be less likely to develop depression because they do have those other areas of life that add to that meaning and enjoyment. So the goal is to come up with a variety of things that help people um, feel that enjoyment, that sense of meaning, and the um, purported mechanism of action for this treatment then is that increased activation, getting people involved in their lives in different ways gradually over time. These different situations also happen on a smaller kind of everyday basis. So each and every day, our patients, ourselves, we have opportunities where we could choose to avoid um, or we could choose to engage in an active coping strategy. So we want to help our patients see those as actual choices and pause to think about it and make um, an effective decision to actively cope versus just kind of automatically engaging in avoidance, which might be what they're used to um, before starting treatment. The core of treatment is to engage in activity monitoring and activity scheduling. That activity scheduling will include three different categories. We target routine activities and their overall schedule. Enjoyable activities to make sure that those aren't um, avoidance at the same time. And then values. And we want to place these along an activity hierarchy, or at least that's what I would recommend. So there are some different um, versions of behavioral activation out there, some of which include an activity hierarchy and some that do not. Um, I really like using the hierarchy because I think it helps give you a really um, specific graduated plan um, that your patient helps develop. And so they might feel more comfortable knowing like, hey, I'm not going to be rushed to do these things that seem really overwhelming and challenging. And we have a roadmap. Um, in front of us that informs the rest of treatment. If we don't have that hierarchy kind of beautiful and complete and perfect, uh, that's okay, but we still want to get patients started. And so while we continue to work on that hierarchy, um, it's important from day one to try to get them to um, agree to, to some sort of small activity assignment just to get the ball rolling. These are some examples of routine activities. So a lot of hygiene activities, activities of daily living. Um, in addition to kind of looking through and, and increasing these activities gradually that often are impacted by depression, it's also important to look at the overall consistency of their schedule. So even if they're um, sleeping eight hours per day, um, if they're going to bed at 10 o'clock one night and 3 a.m. the next, and it's really variable, 
that's not as um, helpful as if it's more consistent and regulated. So in addition to kind of looking at these specific hygiene type activities, we also want to help regulate their overall schedule. We also want to help our patients um, engage in more and more um, enjoyable activities over time. And of course, they might not enjoy much um, when they start treatment. So this could be activities they used to enjoy, um, things that they currently enjoy, which I prefer to phrase as things that um, make them feel slightly less bad. Sometimes our patients feel um, offended or upset at the suggestion that they might enjoy anything. Um, so sometimes some of those phrasing um, differences can make a difference in what they'll disclose to you. Um, and this could also be activities they've always kind of thought they might like but haven't tried. The important point here is that whatever we're assigning them to do to help combat their depression um, isn't also avoidance for them. And so here you might have a patient who says, the only things I enjoy right now are sleep and video games. That doesn't mean we want to assign more sleep and more video games. Um, so instead we can use, if it's a healthy activity, if it's not you know, substance abuse or, or something harmful, um, we could use this as a reward uh, with a time limit. So you know, if you get these other BA assignments done, if you are making progress in your treatment and you do X, Y, and Z today, then you earn your 30 minutes only of video games um, today. And we can do that with other activities too um, that are functioning as avoidance for that patient. Values is the third piece of um, the different activity categories, and this is directly adapted from acceptance and commitment therapy. Uh, part of BA, um, it, it's not just about you know, doing fun things um, or things that you used to think were fun, but also making sure that your life has meaning. Um, we want our patients to be thoughtful, to reflect upon what adds meaning to their lives for them um, to help them recognize these things and then build those into their um, activity hierarchy and help them to gradually increase engagement. And depending on the patient, some patients um, avoid these and kind of rush to the enjoyable activities, um, but some patients are the opposite where they might say, you know, yeah, I, I don't like gardening anymore, but why does that matter? I don't care. But, um, but I know that because of my depression, I'm not the mom I want to be. So let's start there. You know, I want to work on some assignments related to that. So having these, these different categories can help you sometimes find the right in uh, for the patient in front of you to get them started and then fold in other types of assignments from there. This is a brief um, example of what an activity hierarchy might look like. So including activities from all three of those categories and increasing that difficulty um, based on what your patients are telling you. So how challenging would this be for you to do? How overwhelming would you feel to do this? And making sure we're being really specific about the duration of the activity, the, the frequency of the activity, so that we can really make sure we're um, building up from where we start to make those um, slightly more challenging over time. One important topic to talk about is, is rumination because this is uh, targeted differently in behavioral activation versus cognitive therapy and some other interventions out there. And this is something we very frequently see with our patients. So rumination is passively and repetitively focusing on one's symptoms of distress and the circumstances surrounding those symptoms. And within BA, instead of looking at the content of those thoughts and challenging the evidence for and against them, uh, we're going to look at the context and look at them as potential avoidance of other activities. So when they were ruminating, whether they were, you know, removing themselves physically, isolating to do so, or possibly doing something that otherwise would be meaningful and important to them, you know, so were they playing a game with their family and then they got stuck in their head ruminating and then really lost out on what could have been a meaningful interaction. So instead of engaging in that ruminative thought process, what else could you be doing with that time that might be more helpful and meaningful to you? Sometimes our patients really feel that rumination is helpful, that they, if they keep doing it long enough, that they'll get to the bottom of their depression, that they'll figure things out, they'll feel better, um, but they do it more and more and often end up feeling worse and worse. 
So we want to help them reflect on that experience and see what it's like for them. Um, how much time are they spending? How does it relate to their feelings? Um, what might they be either actively avoiding or kind of missing out on through this process to help gain insight into the impact it could be having on their symptoms. And then to help our patients stop that, that rumination or decrease engaging in rumination, we first want them to recognize when it's happening. And we do that through some tracking um, when they engage in rumination or when they're able to kind of notice uh, that urge to do so and resist. And then our, our intervention that we recommend for this is to shift their attention away from the ruminative thoughts and instead engage in some mindfulness. The ideal situation here is that they can engage in a mindful valued activity. So, hey, I noticed I'm, I'm stuck in my head, I'm ruminating. Um, I'm gonna really just get back into this game with my family in a present and mindful, fully engaged manner. Um, if that's too hard, sometimes that's too challenging for our patients. We do have some simple strategies that we can use while we work up to that ultimate goal. So one is a simple mindfulness of the senses um, exercise, uh, 54321, which you see here. Other strategies when people are really struggling are to try to engage in some mentally taxing or potentially incompatible activities. So counting backwards from 100 by sevens, naming all of the animals that live in a zoo from A to Z. So just anything that we can do to kind of get them out of that thought process and then hopefully um, shift their attention back to a mindful uh, valued activity. And with that, I'm going to turn things over to Dr. Loudon. Hello everyone. Um, my name is Chris Loudon and I will be going over first um, standard practices in pharmacotherapy for uh, depression. Um, it's, it, we thought it better to know sort of the standard practices uh, before talking more about um, COVID because um, then you can see how these practices might change over time. So when looking for standard practices uh, for psychiatry, um, it's rather difficult. Um, as I'm sure um, some of you are familiar with, if you ask five different psychiatrists um, the same question, you'll get five different answers. Uh, and that's not to say that each one might not be following evidence-based treatment, but um, each may be considering other factors in their decision. So for standard practices, the American Psychiatric Association has a practice guideline, uh, last updated actually in 2009, uh, which does seem like quite a long time ago. Uh, so I went looking for more updated um, uh, algorithm and came across a, uh, the Psychopharmacology Algorithm Project by a Dr. Osser in the Harvard South Shore program. Um, and so I'll be going through that as well. Um, and so APA guidelines don't start out with, um, don't start out with um, medications, um, more considering sort of contextual um, considerations. Um, so evaluating address functional impairments and quality of life. Are there certain physical obstacles to patients treatment for depression, um, especially with something we want to keep in, in mind when talking about BAs and trying to keep patients active. Um, if there are actual hurdles to them being more active, you're going to want to assess that and how you might address it. Um, you want to coordinate patients care with other clinicians. Um, if they have a therapist, absolutely talking to the therapist about um, what they're doing and collaborating. Um, if they are coming into treatment for the first time, maybe even touching base with a primary care doctor who has had a hand in treating their depression or any other mental illness in the past. Um, and then you're gonna want to think about how are you gonna monitor your intervention? Um, certainly there's, um, some uh, many validated tools. Um, I'm most familiar with the quick inventory of depression symptom symptomatology, the uh, Beck depression inventory and the PHQ-9. Um, you also want to think about how you can help the patient um, adhere to treatment. Are there certain obstacles to them taking their medication? 
Um, are there certain factors at home that make it difficult for them to attend appointments regularly or take medication? And then also, uh, you want to provide psychoeducation. Um, in my experience, if you tell a patient that, hey, we're going to start you on this medication and uh, start taking it and call me in the morning, they're not, you're not necessarily going to have the best outcome. So um, always taking the time to explain um, what you're doing, why you're doing it, what this medication does, and what you can expect um, will make it much more powerful. And then, based on those factors, uh, choosing an initial treatment. Uh, here's a list of all of the first-line medications uh, for depression. Actually, not all of them, because last updated in 2010, it doesn't include some of the more newer antidepressants, but um, there are many options to choose from, from SSRI medications to tri tricyclic antidepressants to MAOI inhibitors, MAOIs. Um, and there's a lot to consider when um, thinking about medications. Um, side effects can be very important. Um, two of the most common reasons that people stop antidepressant medications is because of the side effect of weight gain or sexual dysfunction. Um, weight gain can be very uh, limiting in terms of some, some people for their self-esteem, how they, they see themselves, how active they're able to be. Um, sexual dysfunction, uh, I read a study where it reporting about 40% of people um, taking SSRIs can experience sexual dysfunction. I would guess that that's actually pretty higher than 40%. Um, and you can experience anything between lowered libido um, to difficulty with climax to functional issues and, and sexual dysfunction. Um, you also want to consider sleep cycles. Um, you may get sedation or even activations from some of these medications. If your patient's goal is to have a regular day routine and, your med and the medication's messing with that, um, it may become more difficult for them to complete their BAs. Um, and also other issues like GI issues, um, orthostasis, um, and headache uh, can be intrusive as well. You always want to consider dosing. Um, I've had patients come to me and say, yeah, I've been on five different antidepressants, none of them work. And then we go over the history and find out that they never got past the introductory dose of any of these medications, which means, of course, you can't, um, uh, you can't count those as, as, as trials. Um, what kind of monitoring does the patient need on each kind of medications, both medical, physical monitoring? And then thinking of the timing of the effects. Um, with antidepressants, you can notice improvement in the first one to two weeks, but maximum improvement can take up to four to eight weeks um, at effective dosing. Um, and so um, the APA guidelines are pretty general for starting a medication, uh, stating an SSRI and SNRI, mirtazapine or bupropion is optimal. Um, they do say that no treatment should be continued unmodified if there's been symptomatic improvement. Uh, there has not been sy symptomatic improvement over one month. Um, so, I mean, that includes dose changes. You certainly wouldn't keep a, a patient at the introductory level of, say, fluoxetine for a month, not expecting, um, not expecting to change it if they're not getting better. Um, and then there's always the decision to make in terms of medication, whether we want to augment um, the initial antidepressant that people are on or switch it all together. And um, I'll go into that a little bit. There's a lot of factors that can go into that. Um, and now I, I move on to a separate algorithm. This is a more recent one that I found. Um, and I found it very interesting because even though it does look like there's arrows pointing in a lot of directions, there's a lot of wiggle room there um, for interpretation of different things to try. Um, one thing of note is that um, uh, with non-psychotic unipolar depression, you want to assess the, the situation, first of all. If this is somebody with severe depression in an inpatient setting who really has been unable to function as an outpatient, you may want to consider ECT as first-line therapy, even if they haven't had um, medications in the past. You know, somebody's catatonic or they're not eating or are extreme suicide risk, um, that might be the first option. Um, in more acute settings, you might want to rely on medications um, that have dual action, like uh, an SNRI, such as fenfaxime, or a different medication like mirtazapine. Um, for more mild, moderate depression as an outpatient, um, the recommendations are, are to start a medication like sertraline, escitalopram, or bupropion. 
And that's, um, that is more suggestion based on um, minimal side effects compared to efficacy. Um, these are effective treatments for depression, um, perhaps with the least intrusive side effects uh, based on data. Um, if that's not working, um, then you come to that, that crossroad, that fork in the road. Do you augment what already may not be working or maybe working a little bit, or do you switch to something entirely different? Um, and in that way, um, you, can, uh, uh, you can consider lots of different um, options. Um, and then uh, past that, if there's an inadequate response, you, can, um, you might wanna focus on some comorbidities. Perhaps the depression is getting better, but it is OCD or PTSD that's causing issues, or it's severe ADHD that is causing issues being able to engage in the therapy or being able to engage um, with activities on a daily basis. So following our different categories, different medications you might use that fall into each category. Um, some of the newer recommendations are sort of delineating atypical depression from um, melancholic depression. Atypical depression being more so, you know, can't get out of bed, sleeping all the time, eating a lot more. Um, and um, for those types of patients, they seem to do better with the addition of a second generation antipsychotic like aripiprazole um, or even an MIOY if they're um, able to do that. Um, and then moving on from there, you've got, you, you're realizing that you have pretty treatment resistant depression. Um, and so they're recommending at that point to consider all, another, all other options um, or to um, look into um, off-label medications for treatment of depression. Um, and then I also want to touch on the benefits of a combined approach uh, when talking about psychotherapy and medication. And so actually, when I looked into this, I could find very few, if any, studies comparing medication-only treatment to behavioral activation and medication. Um, there are several meta-analyses um, in literature that compare some form of psychotherapy with psychotherapy and medication, but it's across many different um, schools of psychotherapy. Those um, meta-analyses in general show various effect sizes that indicate a benefit with um, combination therapy for short-term and long-term treatment. Um, so one study I did find that was interesting uh, was a study comparing behavioral activation, uh, cognitive therapy, and antidepressant medication. Um, this is a randomized placebo-controlled trial with those three different arms. Um, and what it found is in severe depression, BA can be as effective as medications. And in general, BA um, or medications is more effective than cognitive therapy in and of itself. For mild to moderate depression, um, there seem to be similar results across all therapies. Um, and for the more visually inclined like myself, that's how this breaks down um, visually. For the, in measuring the Beck depression inventory and the Hamilton rating scale for depression, you can see that in the high severity subgroup on the left, um, medication and BA sort of separates itself from cognitive therapy. In the low severity group on the right, you can say they all kind of travel together. Um, and that's sort of an offshoot of this same study. Um, another thing to consider is relapse prevention, not just you know, how people are gonna respond in the acute setting, but also what is it going to look like for them years down the road in terms of repeat episodes of depression. Um, so I found, um, again, an offshoot of the previous study where they assessed the patients in behavioral activation, cognitive therapy, and antidepressant medication um, over time um, after medication might have been um, discontinued or therapy might have been discontinued. So what they found is that patients treated with just medication and then um, withdrawn onto a placebo have the most significant chance of, hot, um, of relapse um, in one year follow-up as compared to those who had behavioral activation, cognitive therapy, or continued their medication. Um, and so that's how this breaks down visually. You can kind of see that um, placebo, uh, in the placebo condition, uh, more people are going to relapse um, more quickly and, and sooner. 
Um, and the medication and the therapy um, lines hold together until you stop the medication. Um, and, then the me and then people are at much higher risk of, um, of relapse of depression. With uh, the BA and CT is, and, and uh, cognitive therapy arms, you're seeing a continuation of a factor, less chance of, um, of a repeat episode. And so um, now I'm going to turn it back over to Dr. Leonard uh, for a little while to discuss um, general telehealth recommendations. Thanks. So we'll start with um, talking about some considerations in light of uh, COVID-19 related to telehealth. So first, um, some research points to some specific benefits of telehealth. Um, one is that it might um, counteract the impact of perceived stigma on treatment seeking. So for some individuals, they might be um, less likely to take time off of work or to physically go into a clinic um, to seek treatment due to um, concerns related to stigma and telehealth can reduce uh, that impact since they can access treatment from their own home. There are some benefits to cost, um, especially if patients already have all of the technology that they would need. Um, so there's decreased uh, transportation costs and less time away from work um, because they won't have that additional transportation time. There's also an increase in the ability for providers to see patients from a much larger geographical area, um, which um, really points to increased access, which I'll talk about in a little bit as well. And then these reduced barriers to getting to treatment may also increase um, continued engagement and um, reduce the chances of premature treatment dropout. Using telehealth um, has some obvious benefits for access to care, particularly for those in rural communities or um, those who might not have access to high quality evidence-based treatments. Um, through telehealth, they might now have that access. Some recommendations for technology needs to effectively use telehealth um, are that you'll need a secure HIPAA compliant platform. And we've included some um, listed below here. This is not um, an exhaustive list. I'm sure there's more, but here are some popular options. Having an electronic health record certainly makes the process of telehealth much easier. Making sure you're able to send and sign documents, um, especially consent forms electronically using DocuSign or Adobe Pro, for example, um, is very helpful. Making sure you have adequate internet speed for both um, clinicians and patients, especially if clinicians are working from home, making sure they've got that um, figured out in advance. Uh, making sure that our patients have a microphone and a camera on their device. And to really have this be telehealth, they need to have the camera enabled throughout the whole session, which sometimes can be a bit of a challenge depending upon uh, the symptoms we're seeing. And then um, as much as we might not consider ourselves to be experts with technology, our patients are gonna struggle um, sometimes in using this. And so it's great if you work for an organization that has a help desk or a different department that can help with that. Um, but I'll, even if that is the case, um, it's important that providers are prepared to answer at least some kind of initial troubleshooting questions um, as patients um, encounter difficulties with this. To prepare um, to engage in telehealth treatment, it's helpful to ensure that you have electronic assessment measures available. So some of those measures Dr. Loudon mentioned, um, the QUIDs, the BDI, the PHQ-9, um, having those in a format that where we could send that electronically to patients and they can use that over telehealth um, can be very important for informing treatment. Um, also having clinical materials available in the appropriate format. And so, you know, we tend to use a lot of paper and pencil worksheets. And so making sure we have those things available as Word documents or fillable PDFs that we can send to our patients via email. Um, making sure that we can make groups um, or individual sessions engaging. So do we have PowerPoint available that we can share to um, demonstrate different concepts? Can we use videos to make the process more engaging? So if you're 
in a clinic, um, patients might move around and they might have different stimuli. Um, they might go from place to place and interact with different people. Using telehealth, they might be in one place for a longer period of time. And so being able to use different forms of media to make that engaging um, is really important, especially for um, adolescents and kids or people who might struggle with attention. And then for patient care needs with telehealth, we need to make sure that we have their phone number um, and one that they would be um, having accessible the day of the session in case of technology issues. For people working from home um, who maybe weren't doing so previously, there are some apps that can help you to kind of hide your personal cell phone number um, if you'd want that to be confidential um, and still be able to use a personal cell phone to contact patients. So I've listed a few of those there. And then our clinicians and patients need a private space where others won't be able to see and hear any sessions and they won't be interrupted. And it's important to talk about this as well as other telehealth etiquette, clothing guidelines, et cetera, um, with patients before they would start the telehealth process. So if you are offering group therapy via telehealth, we don't want um, someone participating in that group and then a family member just observing the other group members from the living room, for example. So we want to make sure that's really clear up front. All right, I'll turn it back to Dr. Loudon. Thank you very much. Um, so I'm gonna talk about considerations um, in psychiatry um, for this current um, epidemic that we're in, uh, where a lot of patient contact is um, via telepsychiatry or telemedicine. So um, this wasn't necessarily a surprise to me, but the APA guidelines were not very specific. There's more a list of considerations that you should have going into patient encounters using um, telehealth. Um, and so I'll go through each of these sort of individually. Uh, so providers should consider such things as patients' cognitive capacity, uh, cooperativeness with treatment professionals, um, past issues with substance use, history of violence, self-injurious behavior, all the typical questions that we do ask about. Um, but the question becomes, how do you assess that in the telehealth environment? Um, you can consider doing cognitive scales, um, the Montreal Cognitive Assessment or the Mini Mental Status Exam, all of both of which do require um, uh, sort of uh, interactive pieces that you would not be able to do by video. So you'd have to document which parts you were able to do um, with each of these tests. Um, you want to consider compliance. Um, are, are patients able to take uh, medications without supervision? Um, are they able to show up um, online for appointments uh, consistently? Substance abuse could be a huge issue. Um, you'll want to know, are they currently using? Um, they're at home, so the obstacles for them using right before um, a session um, or an evaluation it, are sort of removed. Um, is there a possibility of um, withdrawal from substance use? And how are you going to measure that, um, especially with alcohol, benzodiazepine, opiate uh, withdrawal? Violence you want to consider. Um, is the patient a history of a, per, of a perpetrator or victim of domestic violence? Is there self-harm going on? Is there guns at home? Um, or even other things. I had a patient just the other day who I found out um, had a bow and arrow that was available to him um, that wasn't necessarily uh, screened for by, um, by anyone else beforehand. Um, providers shall consider geographic distance to the nearest emergency medical facility. Um, so if you're talking to a patient and there's acute danger, when you call 911, um, it's not really clear um, how to uh, get in touch with their local authorities. Um, so you'll want to have information readily available in terms of what municipality do they, uh, are, they, are they calling from? Um, do they have a preferred hospital ER? Can you call local authorities? Um, who else lives in the home? Um, are they reliable reporters or helpful when uh, patients are unsafe. Um, you can consider getting the family involved earlier. You'll also uh, want to consider what other meds is the patient taking. Are they stable on those medications? Are there concerns for high blood pressure, diabetes? Um, are they mobile? Can they get to a different level of care if they um, voluntarily uh, would like to? 
Um, and then this becomes sort of a difficulty as well. The consent process shall include discussion of circumstances around sessions um, and management. So if the patient can no longer be safely managed um, through a telehealth uh, scenario, um, then, then what do you do? Um, so I think each clinician sort of has to ask themselves, what are your limitations with, you know, what are your personal limitations with patients considering their um, unique presentation? Um, and then explaining those limitations to patients. Um, you know, we are, we are communicating over telehealth right now, and so there's a degree of separation. Um, and um, there may be ways in which um, we figure, find out that this may not work. Um, and um, you need to um, adjust the level of care or um, the treatment in general. Um, do you trust the patient to go uh, get labs, see their primary care doctor, or take PRN medication if needed? Um, providers should consider whether there are any medical aspects of care that would require in-person examination, um, including physical exams. I touched that on, on that a little bit, but do they have access to an outpatient lab? Uh, certainly Quest labs are everywhere, but not necessarily um, uh, available to everyone close by or um, people wanting to go to during current sort of circumstances. Um, how can you receive previous lab results? You know, patients can no longer come in with a hard copy of these. Uh, you may be contacting other people or patients may be trying to get you, to get you this information other ways. Um, does treatment intervention require regular vitals? Um, certainly the patient could go out, buy a blood pressure cuff, um, other things to be able to track these vitals, but do you trust that that's being done properly or the patient's a good reporter of these things? Um, does the patient have a primary care doc? Um, how, um, how close are they? Do they have easy access to this person? Um, certain tests require sort of just being able to see the whole person and, um, and sort of do some sort of, there's some physical aspects to the, to the exam that just can't be done over telehealth. Um, you know, when looking for tardive dyskinesia with long-term use of antipsychotics, um, we do the AIMS tests or we look for extra pyramidal symptoms, um, side effects of uh, antipsychotics that can be very physical. Um, and then, you know, reasonable questions to ask is, does the treatment algorithm change when medical monitoring or in-person examination is not possible? Um, generally, SSRIs and SNRIs are um, considered very safe for, um, for prescription. But you can have uh, things like uh, platelets, platelets dysfunction that leads to bruising or low sodium levels, which can have, lead to cognitive changes. Um, for stimulants or bupropion, you might consider blood pressure um, issues, or cardiac history. Lithium may be very difficult to describe or to prescribe because you're wanting to track levels. You're wanting to check on thyroid health, on kidney health. Um, uh, getting an EKG is pretty standard for um, lithium as well. Um, Lamotrigine, um, about 10% of people can get a benign rash that we don't worry about, but one out of 10,000 people can get a very severe blistering rash. And so are you confident in telling the difference over video um, uh, if that were to happen? Um, and other medications bring up their, um, their own specific uh, difficulties as well. And you will want to, uh, uh, any psychiatrist will want to document these things. You know, perhaps, uh, perhaps I believe that uh, lith starting lithium is a life-saving measure for this person. Um, but I'm concerned about getting levels or um, thyroid health or kidney health. Um, you could explain the risks and benefits to the patient and um, sort of consider whether risks of not necessarily being able to um, monitor these things is um, greater than the potential benefit. Um, and sometimes that's hard to predict. Um, and so I'm gonna turn it back now to Dr. Leonard. So I'll talk about some modifications to therapy that relate to um, telehealth and um, COVID. But first, I wanted to mention that there is some research support for the use of BA over a telehealth format. Um, a lot of this has come out of the um, VA system, 
So the research either demonstrates that there's comparable improvement between um, telehealth and in-person delivery, or um, maybe a slight advantage in some respects to in-person treatment, but still with some robust improvement across the board in both formats. And so we have good reason to believe that, um, that BA as a specific therapy can be used effectively via telehealth. Um, I know Dr. Lauden mentioned some of this, but um, again, with um, therapy considerations, um, we need to be thinking even more about safety and um, one important piece of that is knowing the patient's location for each and every day that services are provided. And so we tend to get patient addresses at the beginning of treatment, um, but it's really important to review and confirm that so that if there is a safety issue that comes up, we know if, you know, if we have to call in a health and wellness check or something like that, we know exactly where to send them. Um, and right now, hopefully our patients are all programming from uh, the same place or accessing treatment from the same place, but we are finding that sometimes they surprise us and they've decided um, to go elsewhere. And so we need to know about that when it occurs. We also always you know, want to have an emergency contact um, on record, but during telehealth, it's especially important um, whenever possible that that person lives with the patient um, it's great to have a support available for other reasons, but of course, if there are safety concerns, we want someone who can really go in and check on the patient um, and help give us some information. There is a, an article um, from 2014 that specifically outlined some strategies for managing safety um, over telehealth. Um, I think a lot of these are, are hopefully fairly standard, um, regardless of the format of treatment delivery. Uh, but the first one I think is really important. And so at the beginning of treatment, we of course want to assess for suicide risk um, and then use this to determine appropriateness for both you know, their current level of care and also for telehealth. I think you know, at the time this was written, um, we weren't in a pandemic as we are now. And so I think that there's some interesting considerations here um, about access to care. You know, so there might not be as many in-person um, options available to people right now. And so where do we draw that line for who is and isn't appropriate for telehealth? Um, and how do we weigh that against um, other options for treatment, especially if they aren't um, at a level where they would be admitted to an inpatient unit? So I think there's a lot um, of careful consideration that needs to be given in these cases about um, engagement in telehealth and also if they're not appropriate, how do we make sure they get the care that they need? Then using a safety plan um, based on their identified risk um, to ensure that they can stay safe, um, if at all possible, making sure that patient and family have access to that safety plan and understand how to use it. And um, you know, to whatever extent, making sure we have that support person involved in all conversations about safety and also um, in any sort of means restriction efforts needed. Um, again, hopefully that's somebody who lives in the home and can be responsible for you know, securing any items that might pose a risk. And then at each session, again, um, assessing safety risk for those who are intermediate or greater risk, and then continuing to intervene as needed with um, potential for a higher level of care, a health and wellness check or further discussion with emergency contacts or support individuals. Um, impact of telehealth and some modifications. Um, we are finding we need much more parental or spouse involvement. This can help with accountability for completing assignments, um, assistance with safety monitoring, and also with helping them um, just engage in the telehealth process, especially um, with kids, you know, making sure their parents are, are helping them log on to the sessions, troubleshoot any technology difficulties um, and the like. On the flip side of that, especially right now, when many are um, home together, um, a lot of parents might have more availability to observe sessions and there's some benefit um, from having the potential uh, for increased parental involvement in sessions so they can learn right along with their child about the treatment strategies that we're using. 
we need to have an increased focus on rapport building and encouraging disclosure. So especially for you know, patients who've never met their provider in person, or if we have a group session, um, all of the patients you know, have only interacted via video, that can pose some challenges for um, group cohesion, for people feeling willing to be vulnerable and disclose, and we need to spend a lot more um, effort and time on that process. And we'll talk a little bit more, and um, there's a second webinar where we'll focus on some of these strategies, but we're finding a need to do things like, um, you know, more icebreakers at the beginning of groups or more um, just kind of small, small talk between um, providers and patients, um, allowing for patients in group to have more time to get to know each other in a little bit more informal discussion um, to try to encourage some of that uh, rapport. We need to be able to address patient concerns with seeing and hearing themselves. And so this um, often relates to some co-occurring symptoms that we might see related to social anxiety or body image. We've had um, a lot of patients struggle with um, keeping the video on, keeping the microphone on because they're so uncomfortable. And so um, we need them to keep the video on for it to really be telehealth. Um, and at the same time, we're trying to tackle some of those things with some exposure strategies. So can we um, vary the distance um, that they're sitting um, away from the camera? Can we you know, help them work up to a uh, higher volume of speech? Um, sometimes we're starting by kind of having people sit off to the side and then move more to the center. So how can we um, clinically help our patients work through some of their own difficulties that might be impacted by needing to use telehealth. We can also um, gain some useful information from now seeing um, perhaps more of the patient's living area. So if they're um, doing a session from their living room or from their bedroom or kitchen, you know, what does that look like and what does that tell us clinically about their symptoms um, or possible BA strategies? You know, is there is their living space a complete mess? Does it seem like they're not taking care of, um, of themselves or the space around them? Can we come up with some specific ideas um, to incorporate into BA that relate to that? Interestingly, we're also finding that there are some um, benefits to using telehealth that relate to attendance and punctuality. So, um, you know, our, our depressed patients in particular really struggle with um, making it to treatment at all, um, sometimes making it to treatment on time. And through using telehealth, we're finding that that has improved significantly. And so this might be an interesting opportunity for patients who might struggle to engage in treatment um, to reduce some of those barriers and increase their willingness um, to engage in treatment. So there's also the, the impact of social distancing and stay at home orders that's a, a little bit different from the impact of telehealth on our ability to engage in behavioral activation with our patients um, or treatment you know, at all. Um, one thing that, that we're seeing is some overall um, higher acuity um, due to reduced access to care, due to the impact of COVID-19 on um, how people are feeling on, on added stressors. Um, obviously, this is a really challenging situation for all of us to cope with, and, um, and that might lead to increased um, depression, distress, anxiety, safety concerns. And so that's one thing to be prepared for that presents, as I said, some added challenges when we're now using telehealth. Um, we have to be prepared for our patients to be struggling with um, potentially some, some of these added stressors and to talk about that and fold that into their treatment. So in addition to um, behavioral activation, do we need to incorporate more distress tolerance or anxiety management skills, depending on what our patients are struggling with? You know, many of our patients, um, like many of us, might be juggling multiple responsibilities, might be working from home while homeschooling and, and faced with a number of stressors, might be facing health challenges, um, high stress related to being an essential worker. And so being prepared for that and adjusting treatment strategies as necessary to incorporate that. 
uh, we need a lot more creativity um, in how we're going to do BA. Um, so we'll talk more about this in the next webinar as well. But um, a lot of the things we would want people to do historically as BA assignments are, are either impossible or very challenging to do right now. You know, we can't have people go and interact um, with their friends in the same way, um, go meet new people, go join a meetup group, you know, a, a lot of things that they might uh, want to do to increase um, engagement in enjoyable activities or work towards their values might be particularly challenging right now. And so how can we work with our patients to think outside the box to um, help them still engage in BA in a meaningful way um, despite these challenges. And I think a big piece of that too is to make sure we're folding in um, some physical activity, which can be challenging when um, they might be, you know, engaging in a lot of um, use of technology and being somewhat stuck at home. And so making sure to fold all of that in in a creative way that, that still helps um, increase that activation over time for our patients and reduce avoidance. And then, you know, structure and a daily schedule are more important than ever. Um, with social distancing and telehealth, you know, our patients with depression who might already struggle to change out of their pajamas, to shower, to follow a consistent schedule, there's less reason uh, perhaps than ever to, to do some of those things. It might be easier for them to stay in sweatpants and, um, and sleep longer, for example. So how can we um, continue to stress the importance of the schedule to kind of keep some of those same expectations as if they were leaving the house, coming to a session in the clinic and work with them towards that goal despite some of these barriers um, when there might be a lot less structure in their daily life. Um, so those are some of the um, strategies we might need to incorporate related to social distancing. And then, you know, with that, you know, really looking for opportunities to help build connection at a time when people might feel really isolated. And so how can we use our technology, you know, like we are for telehealth um, for some of those BA assignments to make sure that people are still interacting in meaningful ways um, with others. All right. I think I'll hand it over to Michelle. Thank you, Dr. Leonard. Just one moment and I'm pulling up the Q&A section. If you have any questions, please use the Q&A button, not the chat feature on the Zoom taskbar. We will try to answer as many as we can in the time that we do have left. Okay, our first question is, um, any recommendations for individuals who struggle with substance abuse in the AA group that they would attend weekly has now closed due to COVID-19? The individual is now struggling to stay sober and is struggling not having that support. Um, we do have some resources we found where there's a variety of different online um, like meetings that people can attend um, and other um, just online resources for substance use like podcasts and um, relevant videos. Um, so I don't have them kind of available right in front of me, but, um, but I know that they do exist. I don't know if you have more to add to that, Dr. Loudon. Um, yeah, I mean, my, my patients who have um, not been able to do in-person AA and AA groups um, have been doing more so online. Um, and I know a big part of it is sort of a sense of community and support that they get from not only the people in the meeting, but the people that um, you know, they're close to. And so have encouraged them to you know, reach out to people who they already have the contact information for, already have that sort of relationship to see if they'd want to come to virtual sessions with them. And so you can kind of bring some of that, um, you know, AA family with you into those, uh, those, those um, online uh, meetings. And uh, it, uh, yeah, it's certainly not very, it's not the most, it's potentially not the most optimal thing to be doing it online, but um, it is definitely an option. 
Thank you. Uh, the next question is, can you address treatment of the de depressive component of engaging patients with negative schizophrenia syndromes with symptoms with BA? Um, I don't know a lot of the literature on that. I mean, I know there's good support for some CBT strategies um, for psychosis. I will say that um, that I've had some um, experience with that, minimal, um, and found it to be useful um, depending on the severity of the symptoms. But, um, but I'd have to look to the larger literature to see um, what's out there for uh, schizophrenia. Yeah, I'm not aware of, I'm also not aware of any studies as on BA um, use of negative symptoms of schizophrenia, but. Um, Generally, treatment towards that population is um, encouraging things like um, continuing ADLs, um, social engagement, um, things like that. And it's um, those things in particular have been linked with, um, you know, improved outcomes in schizophrenia. So, I, you know, I, I would think it would be a very reasonable approach uh, for someone with schizophrenia who's struggling with um, behavioral activation or negative symptoms. Thank you. Um, the next question is, what does the research say about uh, ketamine versus TMS? Um, as far as I know, there's no head-to-head -head studies on ketamine versus uh, TMS. Um, ketamine is definitely in its sort of infancy in terms of it being utilized on a widespread basis. Um, there's still, to this day, doesn't necessarily um, exist any treatment protocols for ketamine. Um, so you may find different clinics doing things differently, um, not necessarily knowing which is more effective, which isn't. Um, some of the outcomes with ketamine studies have been extremely impressive, um, especially for treatment resistant depression. Um, but it's, it's still sort of, um, it's still sort of very young. And uh, the FDA did just approve the sort of uh, nasal esketamine for um, as augmentation for uh, depression, but um, there's also a lot of guidelines in terms of monitoring for safety. Um, so I'd say it's it's very compelling, but not not necessarily ready for prime time yet. Thank you. Um, the next question is: Are there any books that you would recommend specifically for clients who want to read more information about depression? Um, treatment of depression in general, or BA? Um, there's a, a bunch of different good books out there on um, BA um, and on depression. Um, I really like uh, Cantor, Bush, and Roosh, um, which is on behavioral activations in behavioral activation in a uh, distinctive features series. Um, there's also a patient um, workbook that is by um, Christopher Martel and Michael Addis that I really like. Um, I think it, I don't know, the, I, I'd have to look up the, the title, but um, that one's really good. And then, um, you know, there's a, several like, kind of easily accessible published um, manuals on behavioral activation, treatment for depression, and um, two different books uh, by Christopher Martel and others on behavioral activation that are quite good as well. Thank you. Okay, um, the next question is, are there any concerns with the patient being on an antidepressant, for example, fluoxetine for long-term um, over 10 years? So as far as we know, there's not necessarily any um, contraindications to long-term use of SSRIs, um, medication that's been around for quite some time. Um, there's been plenty of evidence to show that discontinuing an SSRI um, prematurely can lead to um, negative outcomes. And if somebody's been stabilized on it, discontinuing it um, puts them at higher risk for um, for a depressive episode. Uh, that can be mitigated somewhat by you know, circumstances in the patient's life, social circumstances, as well as whether, like I, like I said before, whether or not they're, they're doing therapy. 
um, at the same time. And so, you know, I say all that, but not, not at the same time to say that once you start a medication, you're, you're, you're tied to it for the rest of your life. Um, Cause that's a question that I often get is how long will I have to take this medication? You know, we're always looking for opportunities to limit medication or decrease medication or uh, discontinue it um, if it's necessary. Um, uh, but um, you know, the, the patient just has to have knowledge that there's risks and benefits if there will be uh, discontinuation or that the, if their preference is to not be on medication over the long term, um, I'd want to tell them that, well, you're going to be more successful if you do engage in some sort of um, therapy along with um, uh, before you, you stop the medication or along with the medication. Um, so there's a, there's a lot to consider. Um, so and just kind of sum up that long-winded response, um, there's no known sort of um, uh, negative effects of being on it long term. However, um, coming off of it early can also can can have its negative consequences for sure. Thank you. Uh, the next question is, most people I know do things like play video games, watch TV or movies, or participate in hobbies for longer periods of time than recommended here. Um, but it doesn't result in them suffering from depression. For example, many of us have binge watched Netflix or spent um, several days or, or spent days lounging in our pajamas. Where do you draw the line between when something like that is considered avoidance and or problematic? Um, I, I can start. Um, I, I think that we all do some of those activities some of the time, but um, really it's about the degree of um, impairment that could result from that. And um, if they are missing other important activities because they're you know, spending so much time sleeping or playing video games or watching Netflix, they're turning down um, in-person time with their friends or they're um, late to work or they're, you know, not um, following through with school assignments. Um, that's where it could become more of a problem. And really, if they're not necessarily doing it because it's something that they enjoy, but in response to those painful emotions, they're engaging in those activities as their kind of go-to thing and also not doing anything else that they might um, maybe should be doing at that time or um, would have previously done when not depressed, that's more of a sign that that's a problematic uh, behavior. Anything you'd want to add, Dr. Loudon? Yeah, I just, uh, thinking of a lot of patients um, that I have who, you know, will, will say that, well, I played video games for five hours because I wanted to focus on self-care um, and that's their way of sort of relaxing. Um, and so it, it, it also involves sort of some education in terms of, okay, when does, when does self-care become avoidance in and of itself? Um, and, uh, you know, trying to emphasize the, the, you know, sort of the fine line between, uh, between what is helpful um, self-care and what is avoidance. Thank you. Um, let's see, the next question is, can you discuss your thoughts on the efficacy of using gene testing to determine the effectiveness of meds and or meds that a patient might not metabolize? Sure, I can talk about that. Um, so pharmacogenomic testing is something that's been around for a little while now and is tends to be more widespread. Um, studies will show uh, that, you know, if you take the approach that you get this on everybody, it's not necessarily going to improve outcomes. Um, now, if you take the approach that um, there are some patients that are having significant strange responses to medications and something just doesn't seem right or they're not responding, that um, in these particular patients, um, genetic testing can improve outcomes somewhat. Um, and most of the evidence in um, improving outcomes is on the metabolic factors. Um, like, like, like we're asking the question, I mean, if you're taking medication and you just happen to be a super rapid metabolizer of most antidepressant medications, it's going to be difficult to get up to a therapeutic level of this medication and they're not going to be effective. 
Um, and so you can actually turn around uh, somebody's treatment significantly if you prescribe a medication that is not metabolized by that route that is you know, um, ultra rapid in that patient. So there are some things to be uh, learned from it. It can be, uh, it can be um, helpful um, guidance. It certainly doesn't tell you what medication is going to work for what patient. Uh, but it can provide some, some hints if the patient's already having significant issues with medication or non-response. Thank you. Um, the next question is, um, can you please address um, escatamine for depression? I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that correctly. Um, what is known safety responsiveness, being able to notice as a therapist whether the patient's response is adequate or problematic? Yeah, so I mean, going back to my, to, it, it sounds like that's similar to the question um, previously about um, ketamine um, and treatment of depression. I would just highlight that again, that, you know, it is something that is sort of in its, um, is young in treatment of uh, depression um, and in psychiatry itself. It does require higher level of monitoring for negative side effects. Um, it, it, it is typically um, it should be administered under, you know, the watchful guidance of a clinician. Um, and there's no sort of general protocols that are accepted by the field of psychiatry in terms of um, how those ketamine, um, how the ketamine infusions are done. I mean, sometimes effects can last a few days to a few weeks, um, and then uh, symptoms start to come back. And so there's no good answers in terms of, well, how do you continue treatment? What does that look like when you consider stopping? Um, what are some significant contraindications? Um, and so um, it's, you know, some of the evidence coming out of the studies on ketamine are really compelling, um, but there's, there's still a lot of questions that have yet to be answered about um, its widespread use. Thank you. The next question is, there may be some things that would be really important for overcoming avoidance, but they aren't the things that the client has a lot of control over. For example, with social interactions, we can't control what the, per what the person, the client, is interacting with what they will do or say. How do you put situational events such as that in a hierarchy, hierarchy format? Um, you know, we would look to assign different types of interactions and part of that um, challenge then is, um, you know, you can't control how other people will respond and you don't always know. So you don't want to set your patient up for failure if you don't think they have the skills to navigate that situation. And so if we had a, an assignment for someone to start a conversation with someone new and we knew that they had really poor social skills, um, I would first want to um, do some social skills training with that patient to help them gain the skills to be effective with that BA assignment. Um, and sometimes you can kind of build that in as kind of little mini BA steps that get added to the hierarchy. Um, so we will sometimes do like practice, you know, role plays and, um, and build up to kind of longer spontaneous conversations. Um, you know, similarly, you might have assignments that would be more um, like non-social skills based. And so we'd want to help train our patients to get skills for that. So, you know, like how to build a resume if they don't know how to use Microsoft Word effectively, they're not going to be able to do that BA assignment effectively either. And so helping them kind of practice those skills and gain them through the course of BA and then making those more spontaneous um, situations or more challenging tasks kind of higher up on the hierarchy um, can be helpful. Thank you. And building on that, um, it was requested um, one or two more examples of behavioral activity hierarchies. Um, a whole hierarchy uh, might be tough to, to talk through, but um, there are you know, a variety of different examples I can give. And then um, that is kind of more of the focus of our, our next webinar as well. 
but um, it, it really depends. And so within the different categories um, for routine activities, we might have um, patients just increase the frequency of showering or brushing teeth or um, putting on clean clothes um, each day, things like that, uh, tidying their living space, keeping up with their mail. Um, enjoyable activities often relate to different hobbies, um, possibly different kind of um, games they might play with other people, interactions. And so there are, if they're living with someone right now, there's opportunities for um, some of that potentially. Um, and, and then with values, it might be um, related to achievement related goals. So it could be, I will, um, I'm gonna read a book about leadership for 10 minutes per day or I'm going to work on my college application essay for 20 minutes three times this week. Um, or they could be more interpersonal. Um, you know, I'm going to call my mom uh, three times this week to see how she's doing with social distancing. Or I'm going to make sure to spend 15 minutes each day playing with my kids um, before dinner to work on my relationship with them. So, um, it depends on, on the patient in front of you and kind of what their specific identified values are and um, the activities they enjoy are. And then we'd want to kind of build off of that. Anything you'd want to add to that, Dr. Loudon? No, I don't think so. I think that was very... Okay, thank you. Uh, the next question is, what are some strategies for a client who struggles with SI ruminations before bedtime? Um, yeah, I guess I'd wanna know more about the thought process that's happening. Um, is it really kind of like, why am I here? Why is this happening to me? Kind of like traditional rumination or is it really passing over into more um, kind of like active intent um, or planning for suicide. If it's, uh, you know, sometimes we have patients um, who seem to use thinking about suicide as its own avoidance strategy where it can actually be kind of comforting to them in a way like, oh, I don't need to worry about this problem. This is always an out for me. And so we will um, actually talk about that and, and, and disengaging from that process using distress tolerance skills and proceeding with their life in a valued way. Um, so I guess I, I would want to know more of kind of like the, the function and, and what's happening in the situation um, to intervene. But we do, you know, when there, when there is um, more SI involved, um, we would of course, you know, assess and follow through with, you know, safety measures. And we do sometimes fold in some um, DBT distress tolerance skills as well. Yeah, I would second that. You, understanding the context of the suicidal thoughts is extremely important. Um, you know, they, you know, I've, I've certainly had patients who have said, well, my, my depression gets really bad at night because that's when my suicidal um, ideation comes up more. Um, you ask more questions, you find out, well, no, I don't, I don't want to, I don't want to commit suicide. Like these, these, these thoughts are really, really scary to me. Um, and, and you might want to look at whether these are intrusive thoughts um, as part of another disorder, um, like, like OCD. Um, is it really depression? Um, what purpose is the, is the suicidal thinking serving in that moment? Does it feel like an escape or does it feel like a nuisance or does it feel like, um, you know, something, and then obviously assessing for safety, something that they're liable to act on, uh, planning, how active are these thoughts? Um, and so um, I think in each sort of patient, you'd have to consider the context in terms of how to address it. Thank you. Um, we've had a few questions about teletherapy, um, specifically if you um, could discuss the challenges of doing telehealth with children? There are challenges. <laughs> um, that is something that we're uh, kind of actively working through. Um, you know, I think having, having kids engage for longer periods of time in front of the video can be a big challenge. And so, um, 
certainly needing a lot more parent engagement whenever possible and um, also just trying to make um, make the interactions more interesting and interactive when possible um, so looking to incorporate different games or um, you know making um, kind of different treatment activities related to um, to things that they care about you know so we're using different kinds of videos to illustrate points and um, trying to make the treatment more fun but um, but we are still finding some challenges there thank you and um, that also is a part of that they were interested in any information about family teletherapy and how that is working for the treatment of depression um, I think that's actually that's going really well. Um, so we are having family sessions that are occurring over video and um, and it I think that that seems to be a, less challenging than um, than maybe some other aspects but um, but for the most part I feel like families are able to engage well over telehealth format and in some instances they're much more engaged in you know, their child's treatment just from being a little bit more accessible and able to access treatment. Um, they might be more able to access family therapy by being able to do so via telehealth. Um, so that seems to be running fairly smoothly. I don't know if that's similar to your experience, Dr. Loudon. Yeah, the other thing I would add is that I just, I mean, just now that everybody is at home, people are spending much more time with their families. Um, and so that has that can sometimes give have complications in and of itself, but it also means that their family's observing um, them every day and can provide really meaningful feedback um, because uh, they're there um, and uh, it's not you know what they they're not reporting you know what they said on a text message two days ago there were, or two weeks ago they're they were, they're talking about the behavior they they've observed in real time and so it can be really really valuable right now. Another question about family um, teletherapy. Um, when working with children um, who are at home, how do you assure the space is confidential and the parents are not listening? Um, I mean, I think it depends on the age of the, the child and when you want the parent involved, when you maybe don't want the parent involved so that the child discloses more. Um, you know, I think that a lot of that has to do with really good education up front at the beginning of treatment about what the expectations are and, and also um, having the camera in a space where you feel like you can see um, who is in the room when possible. We're also recommending that people, you know, be in a private room with the door closed and um, have signs on the door so that no one else is entering and using some strategies like that. Um, if it's a case where we're, we're worried that someone is in the space that we really don't want in the space or that the patient's not following the telehealth etiquette, then we have a pretty serious conversation about that where, you know, are, you, are they appropriate to continue treatment if we're concerned about confidentiality, um, especially if it's a group um, session and other people in the home are kind of observing when they shouldn't be. Um, so that would obviously have to be taken very seriously, but otherwise if it's, um, you know, a parent who otherwise has, you know, access to their um, information and is participating in treatment, but we might not want them there for certain aspects. Uh, that's more of a, a clinical conversation that we'd have to have with both the patient, potentially, depending on their age and the, the parent to navigate that. Yeah, and in these sessions, I'll generally tell patients, um, you know, this is this is the setting that I'm in. Um, and this is how your, your privacy is sort of um, uh, guarded on, you know, the end that I'm on, but also uh, to just ask them, do you feel like you're in a place where everything you talk about is confidential? Um, and if not, is that possible to, to change um, the circumstance or do we need to reschedule this um, if you're uncomfortable with having um, it with it not being potentially very private? Because um, I, I, my fear would be that a patient would go along with a session knowing that it's no longer um, private because they hear, you know, family member in the background that you can't necessarily see. And so um, empowering the patient to just say, 
I think we might need to do this another time or I'm worried about my confidentiality right now. And so um, I wanna discuss this another time. Thank you. Um, the next question is, um, what would you, what would the presenters recommend um, for addressing issues of loss? For example, job loss, cancellation of events like graduation, wedding, sport, uh, sporting seasons due to COVID-19 for depressed clients from a, a BA perspective? That's a tough one. Um, you know, I, I think there are real losses that are occurring for people and giving them, you know, some space to feel that and recognize that is important. Um, and, you know, validate the experience that everyone is, is having, that the patient might be having, um, and then try to um, talk through how they can find meaning in their current experience. So are there unique opportunities right now? Um, I think it, the toughest scenario is, is those who might be living alone and, and completely isolated, but, um, you know, if, if they if they're living with family, are there any opportunities to do things um, with their family that they haven't done or to make use of this time in a unique way or to try to contribute to society in a way that feels meaningful for them? So, um, you know, finding some COVID specific activities to do um, to, you know, decorate your house with uh, window art or to write letters to people who might be isolated in, in nursing homes or trying to find ways um, that, that maybe they can feel more positives come out of this situation and um, build upon that in addition to some of the just kind of general, you know, BA assignments we might typically have them do in other times while also giving them the space to kind of um, talk through but not ruminate about um, the challenges that they're currently facing. Thank you. And thank you again, Drs. Leonard and Loudon, for taking the time away from your clinical practice, as well as sharing your valuable insights with us. I'd also like to let you all know that Rogers is here for those struggling with mental health or addiction, now potentially more than ever. We're, we are continuing to accept patients in both inpatient and residential settings in Wisconsin. And we're very proud to be offering Rogers Connect Care our virtual option for those needing intensive outpatient levels of care. Dr. Leonard and Loudon, before we can uh, conclude, please share your recommendations on additional resources for our participants. Yes, yeah, so here we have um, a variety of different organizations that um, and websites that have resources available um, related to the current pandemic as well as related to the treatment of depression. Um, so the CDC and uh, various other organizations for pandemic resources, of course, um, as well as the NIH, APA, and then um, the Anxiety and Depression Association of America has a lot of great resources um, just for general treatment of anxiety and depression. And they also have some specific resources um, related to coronavirus. Thank you. That about wraps it up, everyone. I just want to remind our participants that uh, those of you who met the requirement or the required time commitment will be eligible for CE credits. You will receive an email with a link to the mandatory evaluation form. Once you have completed it, you may download your CE certificate for the event. We will also have a recording of today's webinar and the slides available on our website rogersbh.org. My email is michelle.cals at rogersbh.org. In case you should run into any problems or have further questions um, that I can assist you in answering. I hope you'll join us next week, Thursday, May 7th, for the final webinar of the series Treating Depression During COVID-19. Doctors Adrian McCullers will join Dr. Leonard to discuss creative ideas for actively scheduling in light of social distancing and additional strategies for building rapport and encouraging disclosure while providing treatment through a telehealth format. On behalf of everyone at Rogers, we look forward to partnering with you to help you support your patients. Thank you.